It's a special pleasure to introduce this year's vocation of the writer. And before we begin, I just want to briefly mention the history of this talk, which is something that has Jesuit roots. It emerged from conversations between Tom Landy, the director of the McFarland Center, and myself after we had literally, literally taken a pilgrimage to follow the footsteps of Ignatius with others over 10 years ago. I went to Tom afterward with the idea of bringing a writer who could talk about an aspect of their work in terms of vocare, which as a verb means to call, to name, to invoke. What is the calling of the writer in our time? In what ways is writing itself an act of vocation? Every writer, of course, has a different answer for all of the arts require on some level an act of faith, whether one is housed in a particular religious tradition or not. Tonight, we will hear from yet another prominent, nationally prominent writer, Josh Schenk, and an important voice in American letters. And all of this is to say thank you, Tom Landy, for your trust and your vision, your creative leadership of the McFarland Center, and your ongoing support of this series. Joshua Schenk comes to us with a large accolade filled career. He's a writer, an editor, an arts organizer. Since 2017, he's been the editor in chief of The Believer magazine, which is a five time National Magazine Award finalist. The Believer is a bi monthly literature, arts, and culture magazine now housed at the Black Mountain Institute, the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. And I encourage you all to look it up if you haven't already and uh, read it and consider submitting some work. It's, it's an amazing publication. Self-branded highbrow, but delightfully bizarre, the magazine has been a vibrant literary center for the creative and the rigorous since its beginning in 2003. And now under the helm of Josh Schenk's, Schenk, it has become a particularly important venue for literary nonfiction. Joshua Schenk is also the director of the Black Mountain Institute, which is in itself fast becoming a center for the study and support of American literary nonfiction, among other genres, hosting an MFA, a fellows program, and a refuge for writers in exile. Supporting ongoing dialogue about 21st century forms of literary nonfiction is one of Josh Schenk's passionate literary concerns. In an interview with The Rumpus in 2017, he commented, the borders between the genres are really exciting and fecund, but it's not a cause of casual conversation for me. As he went on to say, truth and beauty are hugely supporting, and there is such a thing as verifiable fact material that at least in theory can be observed by any number of people so as to be considered facts. In this moment, when in the field of nonfiction writing in general, the role of fact is both widely misunderstood and in ways under attack, Schenck's work is vital. Indeed, when we look at the larger political landscape where misinformation is regularly used to sow seeds of mistrust about scientific fact, it seems more vital still. Another of Schenck's intellectual passions is the field of creativity studies. His most recent book, Powers of Two, Finding the Essence of Innovation in Creative Pairs, disrupts the Western mythology of the lone genius by looking at the creative generative dynamics of teamwork, examining famous creative pairs such as John Lennon and Paul McCartney. Schenck is known for writing that is both fiercely intellectual, yet understanding, grounded in stories that are as deeply researched as they are considered. In his Moth Radio essay, You Can Come Back, he explores a son's search for connection to his father, taking as material his own experience. In his masterful book on Lincoln, Lincoln's melancholy, how depression challenged a president and fueled his greatness. Schenck explores with meticulous detail the nuances of Lincoln's depressions, which he calls his radical gloom, 
And while he does not romanticize depression as an illness, particularly as he is upfront about his own struggles with depression, he posits the ways in which looking at Lincoln's story fully, a whole other tale emerges, one which complicates current thinking about depression, personality, and society, which we tend to view in clinical terms as pathology. It is this ability to simultaneously dig deep into personal experience while digging deeper still through reportage into the external, which marks Shank's work and places him in the tradition and flow of the best writers of literary nonfiction in our time. In this afternoon craft talk, Shank spoke to students about writing from a place of what he called heartbrokenness, a place of vulnerability where we connect to core concerns about being human, connection, acceptance, love, and meaning, and to be wary of perfection. I was pleased to hear him mention some lyrics from Leonard Cohen's iconic song, Anthem, because I have to admit, while preparing for Schenck's visit, revisiting his works, and thinking over his impact on our literary culture, lines from that song kept coming back to me. As Leonard Cohen, the enigmatic and brilliant bard, wrote of our time, and this is Cohen, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Please help me in welcoming Joshua Schenk. Okay, I think I'll turn this on. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, terrific. Um, Leila, thank you for that very generous introduction. It's really very moving to me, uh, very moving to be um, seen in that in that light. Um, and thank you to Tom, and th thanks Oliver, and thanks everyone for such a warm welcome and for all the work you're doing to build community. Uh, I am very moved to be in a context where uh, literary arts um, and the aspirations of scholarship and knowledge can be considered alongside faith. In my mind, those are quite elastic, the, the, the uh, boundaries between those categories that incite um, I think a great deal of opposition in other quarters, but in, in my mind are are, are quite uh, combined. Um, I thought I would read a couple of really short things uh, first, and then I'll tell you about uh, about the the lecture I brought, or the, the talk I brought. Um, it was it was uh, really uh, sweet to to be uh, with some students earlier this afternoon, and I. I, I wrote uh, a handful of uh, tiny little uh, pieces of advice about the writing life. This is one I didn't get to. I'd like to read to you now. A sentence is like a jar of almonds. Do you know how some jars of almonds, the ones in round plastic containers that you can buy in the snacks aisle of a CVS, do you know how when you remove the plastic top, there's a second surface? a thin slice of foil. It has a tab that protrudes over the edge of the circumference of the jar, and you can take hold of it with your thumb and forefinger and pull it off. And there's a kind of whoosh, and perhaps a smell, and it ought to be a fresh smell. Something underneath has been preserved and is now exposed. Sometimes a sentence feels that way. Sometimes, though, it feels like a shroud. Sometimes a sentence feels like something you have wrapped over something that was once alive. But it ought to feel and smell fresh. Um, and I'd like to read you one other short uh, piece. That you, I'm going to read to you something that was very much affected by... Uh, uh, a time that I'm still not sure whether to call the night or the morning. It feels like the middle of the night 
it's actually technically the the morning um, and uh, this is this is a piece that I I, I wrote in, in those liminal hours in that liminal space it's a clock on the bedside table it's a magical clock it looks like a clock but it's a plant by the CIA it's a clock my mother gave me it's a replica of a clock my grandmother had in her condo in North Miami Beach hers was Bakelite and mine is plastic it's my brother David's clock which I stole from him but he would never know it's here because in the five years I've lived in this city, he has never once visited nor suggested he would. It's a portal to an ordering system where the period in which the earth turns on its axis, on its axis is organized into units with discrete measurement. It's a dash of orange plastic atop a block of oak. It is 4.15 a.m. Um, I, a bit, little bit of a magical thinking uh, for me, and, and uh, maybe my, my own uh, stab at uh, a kind of magical realism. Um, but I am, as Leela said uh, more beautifully than I, I can say, quite committed and devoted to the literature of fact. I believe in power and beauty of all the genres, um, the uh, fiction, poetry, and uh, you know, many other uh, places from which um, beauty can be approached. But the particular relationship between truth and beauty in the literature of fact, um, I think is a, it's a um, often misunderstood practice. And it, you know, my, my belief in it is quite simple that there is an integrity to fact that is quite like the integrity of wood in the practice of, of a carpenter's life, and that uh, good wood, um, properly used uh, with care and attention and rigor, uh, can yield uh, beautiful and useful things. And I've often had the experience, um, you know, fact checkers are often kind of, we were, I was just <laughs> having a, conversation about my love for copy editors. You know, the copy editor is the person after a piece has been conceived and shaped and structured and edited for ideas and for structure and for, for meaning. The copy editor is the person who goes like a surgeon over the sentence and uh, examines syntax and, uh, and, and usage and, uh, and punctuation. And th there it's that's, they're often talked of as sort of an annoying people, and I do I do think of them as, as surgeons and as you know, these most delicate practitioners of, of the most subtle art. And I have the same feeling about fact checkers who, who are you know there to very often annoy writers uh, with you know uh, requests not only to kind of examine very specific details but to supply evidence for them. Um, and, but I've often had the experience that when a piece is fact-checked um, and something that I had no idea was problematic is discovered by a fact-checker um, and, and corrected, that the sentence uh, is more beautiful. And I had no idea that there was something wrong. And it, rem and it always reminds me of a time when I was a kid, I went to a dentist and I had... Uh, there was something weird in my teeth and I kept moving my tongue. You know, you move your tongue to your tooth when there, you feel something off in your mouth. And um, it had been going on for months and I went in for my checkup and my dentist said, oh, there's just a little bit of um, a growth there and he just cut it right out. And it was suddenly my mouth felt um, right again. And I've often had that feeling when I'm fact checked that a sentence, there's something dead and, and there's a and to return to the metaphor of, of wood there's something there's something uh, rotten in the sentence and I didn't even know it until the fact checker fact checker identified that there's that there's a problem um, in its foundation in verifiable knowledge and that when the sentence is rewritten to account for it often condensed because 
you know, oh, well, if we can't verify that fact, we just need to cut that part out, suddenly the whole thing feels much more deeply true and, um, and resonant. Um, I, what I wanted to um, bring to you tonight is, um, and perhaps we can explore resonances uh, between these preoccupations, but I wanted to bring to you another long-standing preoccupation of mine um, about the relationship uh, between uh, writing and time and relationship. Um, and I'll read you this piece. That I think it'll take me about 20 minutes to read, and I'll be very um, eager to have conversation with you. And as you'll see, I've been, though I am meeting you all for the first time, I've been thinking about you for a long time. Uh, this piece is not yet titled. Uh, I'll um, read it to you now. Writing is time travel, and the destination is now. But what is now? And how do you get there? Or how do you get here? I'm up in the night thinking about this. I stir at about 4 a.m., lay in bed for about a half hour watching I Am Not Your Negro, the documentary about James Baldwin. Then I got up, picked some clothes off the floor, did my dishes, and does any of this mean anything to you? I can't know, of course, not in the now of composition. You exist, but you're a month from now and on the other side of the country. My best sense of physics is that you have no felt sense of our relationship in this now, but perhaps my understanding of physics is wrong. Perhaps you do feel a tremor. Perhaps on the morning of January 16th, 2020, you felt something. Briefly, we will know each other, a knowing made possible by my anticipation of you. Time will move forward, I think it will, until we meet, at which point we will travel back together to the time I did not know you, but imagined I would. We will travel back together to the time that I was imaginatively traveling forward. This is what we are doing together now. Writing is time travel, and the destination is now. But what is now? And how do you get there or here? My apartment sits atop a bookstore in Las Vegas. I'm at my desk, a cut of mahogany over four metal posts painted glossy white. I'm wearing sweatpants and a t-shirt with a stain. It's dark out, but some electric light from the street leaks in through my windows. My desk is lit by a candy-colored yellow lamp affixed to the desk with a clasp. I'm at my desk now because in about a month, I'm going to have another now with you. And I want to have an experience. I want you to know me and I want to know you. I try to imagine the room, to put myself there, but I get hung up on even the barest details. Will it be lit by overhead fluorescence? Or will the lighting be recessed and indirect? Are you in fold-up chairs or in fixed seating? Is anyone wearing red? What will the lectern look like? Or will a well-trained elephant hold the printed pages of my little essay for me in the nook of its trunk? I'm being silly. I'm trying to loosen up. I need to let go of my fear that this won't go well and come back to presence. But what makes presence? 
How is it achieved? Just be here now. Okay, but which here? Is it the here of this apartment? Where I am alone and weird? With green tea and a Mondrian mug from the Museum of Modern Art? Or is it the here I am preparing for? In this room that probably won't have an elephant on the stage. I have to simultaneously occupy both realms. Here, here in quotes, is not a movie still. It is a lenticular image. You have to see two or more images at the same time and somehow hold them as one. And it's the same thing with now. Now exists in a relationship between the past and the future a relationship that is constant, acute, and perilous. We have an illusion of now that it's a fixed thing, in the same way that we have an illusion of the self as an entity distinct from the other. But in fact, the self is bound up in the other, shaped by it, whether by attraction or repulsion or absorption, or some combination of these. Human beings are not individuals. We are symbionts. Likewise, the illusion of now is that it exists outside of a relationship to time. But if there's to be any kind of presence, you need some equanimity with the past or else it will lash at you like a Rottweiler on a leash and it's snarling and it's unclear if the person holding the leash is going to let go. And to be present at all, you have to have some faith in the future. I don't mean faith in any kind of broad and abstract sense. I mean it in a minute and particular way. If I didn't have some faith, for example, an active, vital faith in the ongoingness of the floor, say, beneath my feet, or in the unlikelihood of a burglar bursting through my apartment door, how could I sit in this chair and press my fingers against these white keys? A philosopher once said, in order to think, I have to first know that my hand is not going to turn into a parrot. But the faith is even more minute in particular, for each time I move my finger, I do it in the expectation that a physical action, for instance, the pressing of the P key, which I do with my right pinky finger, it splays off from my hand with a dancer's grace, will correspond to an action on the screen. And of course, I have faith that this action will correspond to an experience in the physical world to the movement of my voice when I come into the room to meet you. My faith in the future is so easily disrupted and I live in a constant state of anxiety. I worry about this talk not going well. I worry about my dress shirt being a little tight around my belly because I've gained a few pounds. My printer keeps jamming and perhaps the printer jam is a metaphor for anxiety because it highlights this constant possibility of the failure of things in which we are bound up every day but which we have no capacity to understand. How does tapping a few keys on this machine lead to the impression of ink against paper in that machine several feet away? The more abstract these machines get, the more the anxiety mounts. Think of all the things that have to work just to play a single song on Spotify. For the first three decades of my life, I had racks of cassette tapes and then compact discs. I knew where the music was, but where is it now? God, I don't know. But even the most complex sequence of machines could be explained, and quite precisely. I might have to work at it for a few weeks or a month, but I could come to understand the progression of events that leads me to hear, I left my wallet in El Segundo on Spotify, but people, 
people you could study for the whole age of God and still not understand. I'm excited. I'm excited at my desk at the prospect of talking with you, of being with you. I am lonely. I am often with other people, often in warmth and even in love, and yet there is an essential loneliness that these relations don't seem to touch. I have a need to see and be seen, to know and be known, to touch and be touched, that goes beyond what can happen in time. This morning, when I stirred and watched I Am Not Your Negro, about James Baldwin, made by the filmmaker Raoul Peck, I felt my heart soften and some grief rise up about the broken world we live in, a grief activated by the beauty and concision of Baldwin's sentences, voiced so humbly and fiercely by Samuel Jackson. I felt some small despair when I turned the film on, a despair about finding the next right action, and this film brought me back to life, back to the struggle. It took Raoul Peck 10 years to make I Am Not Your Negro. Based on an unpublished manuscript, James Baldwin wrote decades before. 10 years to make a 93-minute documentary. Can you tell me again what you mean by be here now? In Back to the Future, time travel is achieved with a DeLorean equipped with a flux capacitor, which is fueled by plutonium and activated when the car hits 88 miles per hour. Okay, so here's what I'm thinking. If the destination is now, the flux capacitor is relationship and the plutonium is desire. But what does the speed signify? The present depends on anticipation of the future, but it's also true that any moment contains so many varieties of futures. Last night, I drove about 12 miles across town to the home of a couple who support the arts, and each second or microsecond of that drive was bound up in a faith that I would reach their doorstep, which itself was bound up in anticipation of crossing their threshold and walking into their broad hallway where there hangs a variety of wonderful art pieces, including a Dennis Hopper and a variety of William Wegmans and a Julian Schnabel. I used ways to get to their house. It took me to what it said was the destination, and I looked on the map, and I could see, in fact, I was there, in a sense, if there meant adjacency to my friend's small estate, which includes, in its capacious backyard, a doghouse designed by Frank Gehry. But if there meant easy access to their doorstep, I was about a half mile away, for Waze had brought me to the gate at the far end of their property. My friend who lives in the house later described to me what it would have been like had I parked my car and hopped the wall. I could have gotten to their door, she said, but I would have gotten wet. The other night I had dinner with an artist friend, a young man, an Iranian, who was in exile from his country. Just a few days before, the US military had assassinated the top general in his country, and now there were protests every day in Iran, and people were being shot. I asked him how he was doing, and he said he felt numb. He felt awful in his body, he said, and he felt sick. But he didn't feel sad. He didn't feel any emotion, really. And I said, trying to be helpful, this is what grief is. Grief is mostly the alienation from grief. Grief is an abscess, and you have to find ways to bleed it. The needle in this metaphor I offered to my friend. This is more or less how I think of art. Several hours have passed now, and I'm getting tired. Thank God, because as Baldwin says, he who cannot rest cannot be long for the battle. I often have trouble sleeping, and I've tried CBD and Xanax, much longer list could be inserted here, and meditation, 
but these all feel like band-aids over a river of blood when I'm feeling disconnected. You know how they swaddle babies, wrap them up tight like a burrito? I have a similar thing, a similar need, only the blanket I need to be swaddled by, I picture it like one of those stretchy materials they use for ace bandages, is a sense of being bound up with other people in a place of mutual goodwill and purpose and ongoingness. Goodwill means we're not angry at each other and purpose means we're in broad agreement about what we're, about what we're doing here and ongoingness means that we had experiences last week and we will have experiences in some form next week, etc. I am not stuck at the check-in counter at the airport pleading for the attendant to rebook me after a cancellation. I'm on the moving walkway. My bag is crisply packed, and I'm headed to the gate to see you and our other friends. Last night, I got into bed with the distinct sense that the fabric had a tear in several places. And the only thing keeping me going this morning is a sense that I can come out of this torn place and talk to you. And it's working. I'm getting tired now. I'm slurring my words. Men, people don't want to connect because it hurts. It's like being a ping pinball and begin smacked by a paddle, ev fits. No, it's not so that I like to bowl, it's more that I think it's an arena. The goal has to be to reach. You can't take it personal. The cops are on the library steps. A-I-L-J-F-I-K-I-K-L-K, semicolon, L-L. Here's what just happened. Feeling myself drift off, I went to the big white couch and put eye shades on and earplugs, and I slept for three hours. I owe this sleep to you. I time traveled a little bit to the future with you, a future now, and then came back to my body, tired. I began to read recently a book about the nature of sleep it claims to explain the real physiological reasons for sleep, the reason, reasons that the scientist author has, admit, has made advances in understanding. But when we ask what purpose sleep serves for waking life, perhaps we have it backward. Perhaps waking life is meant to serve sleep. Perhaps the purpose of being awake is to return to dreams and away from the carrying case of our body and back into use as minds unloosed, unloosed from a singular physicality, unloosed from linear time. The image occurs to me quite the opposite use of the same suitcase image from earlier in this essay of clothes packed away, folded up or rolled to fit into a suitcase. Maybe that's what we are when we're awake, all packed away. And maybe the clothes want to be flung out, hung up, ready to show their curves. And maybe the same is true of our thoughts and our imaginings. And if this is the case, perhaps the question of how we organize our days and our lives really does hinge on the question of what will, at the end of the day, put us to sleep. What if everything we do with our bodies and our waking hours is really designed for us to let go of those bodies? What if all our intoxications by beer or sugar or ketamine or nicotine are only pale simulacra of that most pure form of transcendence? Maybe intoxicants are essentially an attempt at lucid dream. Two things people often do before sleep is have sex or read. Sex is the thing we do to leave our bodies but also to occupy them. And when sex works, it's weird to put it this way, but it's what I mean, not whether sex is good, but when it works, when it does the thing it's for, 
we occupy our bodies in a way that allows us to leave them. I happened to be sharing a wall in an apartment complex with new tenants, two women, one in her late 20s, I think, and the other in her mid-30s, and I hear them. I heard them last night at about 9 p.m., and a day or so ago I heard them even more decidedly in the morning. Why do I bring this up? I guess because I'm interested in those sounds. And I'm interested in how one of the women, my impression is that the sounds came from just one of them, though I can't be sure, is vocalizing as a way of reaching her lover. Perhaps a way it reached, but perhaps the way it reached me and others in the apartment complex is also not incidental. My own girlfriend was in this apartment with me a few months ago and noticing the walls we share and the nature of my relationship, which is a kind of oblique but still real power relationship over those other tenants, she said, we need to be quiet. And we were when we made love. She showed her pleasure to me with her eyes, and I felt her open, but she kept quiet. How do you come into time? That's the question of life. How do you come into time? And hopefully you have a few minutes to do that before it all ends. In Back to the Future, Time travel is achieved with a DeLorean, equipped with a flux capacitor, which is fueled by plutonium, inactivated when the car hits 88 miles per hour. The flux capacitor is relationship. The plutonium is desire. But I'm still not sure how to get up to 88 miles an hour. The actual DeLorean speedometer only went to 85. Writing is time travel, and the destination is now. But how do you get there? Excuse me, and the destination is now. But what is now, and how do you get there? I'm on my way to see you now. I'm on a plane. Delta flight 4124 from Las Vegas to JFK. They've just played the safety video. It's not how far we go. It's how far we go together. There are eight exits, two, over, two on each side and two over each wing. A plane is a peculiar here, a liminal place between two poles. Where are you? Somewhere between Las Vegas and New York. Now I'm above the desert where I see a dry riverbed, so curvy, so odd, so much movement that doesn't seem to have any purpose. Next to it, I see the cut of a road in clean, sharp lines. Now I'm over snow. Is this the Rockies? The man in front of me is watching a documentary about the Detroit Pistons. Now he's watching a documentary about Muhammad Ali, and we're over the clouds. What time is it? It says 1.42 on my phone, but is this specific time, or did I pick up a signal and did my phone adjust? I think it's probably 142 Mountain Time and therefore 342 Eastern, which means we have two hours to go. The real meaning of time is how much do we have left? How much more do I get? How much more do I have to endure? Now the man in front of me is watching the new Quentin Tarantino movie. Margot Robbie is in a bedroom in cut off shorts, dancing to a record player. Brad Pitt takes off his shirt on the roof and lights a cigarette. Now we're over the water. We had to overshoot New York and circle around, so we're over the Atlantic Ocean. I see a boat painted white on the top and yellow at the bottom. I see clouds in the distance, a pink sky. When I land, I'll connect to Wi-Fi, and I'll know what time it is, but for now, I'm just going to bring my seat to its upright and locked position and know that I am somewhere in between, once was and will be, somewhere between just then and coming soon. I'm in the now, the dynamic, unfixed now, and I am traveling. Thank you. <laughs> Wow.
Oh, yeah. Thanks. It was that was really moving. I really felt you all, and uh, that's, tri that's trippy. <laughs> I did really did spend a lot of time imagining <laughs> imagining this place and uh, and this exchange and d doing a quite a poor job of it compared to the immense reality of actually being here. And it's so it's incredibly humbling because I'm just so aware of like how little of this I can possibly take in you know it's like there's an ocean of life in this room and like maybe at best I could like you know sip it in a, in a straw uh, take a little sample and a, and a little uh, you know and a little um, you know a, a little jar and, and, and seal it up and, and take it back uh, which I, you know, I guess in some ways is the, is the humility that that piece kind of springs from. So, what should we talk about? What's next? I should say, you know, this is a total first draft of something. I mean, I, not a first draft of that I wrote it last night or anything, but um, it's still something that, you know, I'm, it's it's a it's a record of a long-standing preoccupation and a kind of a form that I found for it and a form that I really imagine you all as you know collaborators in and so I, and one thing I just I want to say before we talk is that I'm I definitely am asking myself the question you know how does actually being here and being in this room how does that how does that shape what what I'm what I'm doing here. Um, but yeah, what what's on your mind? What's in your hearts? Yeah, Oliver. <laughs> well, I would say you know, I. The question is, uh, did we did we meet your expectation, and how how am I going to revise it? I would say I definitely felt a lot of uh, of connection, which is the thing that I'm most interested in. There's a moment. When I, and this is something I probably should um, acknowledge in, in revision, you know, there's all this stuff in the piece about how I want to know you, I want to connect with you, I'm lonely, but I, I think I, I did not account for um, the way in which, you know, um, I have a tendency to narcissism and isolation and that you know, I might describe that as a shadow, but in some ways that also kind of governs. And this is the paradox, I think, of artists' li lives, that artists are, I think, often more intensely interested in, than, than ordinary people in connection, but also more likely to, to really not only be prone to go into their own minds, but to really want that. And so the, you know... The preoccupation with knowing you all and imagining this place, I think, is that that is the kind of uh, tender, like yearning underneath it. But I also want to find a way to acknowledge, like, it's also a kind of intensely narcissistic thing. And you know, maybe I don't want to be so pejorative as to call it deluded, but it's like also. Um, I guess I just want to find a way to acknowledge that, you know, I'm also, uh, it, it's not a totally, you know, bilateral exchange. This is a, this is a, 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 a much more unilateral thing. Me speaking to you, me with, you know, the advantage of a month of preparation and the kind of, you know, the privilege of that introduction and the position on this lectern and the terrific microphone that makes me feel like Madonna. <laughs> uh, you know, and yet then I, but everything is paradoxical. You know, is it unilateral? You know, and how, and I, you know, I asked this question, you know, is my understanding of physics incorrect? I actually, I actually think that's, I didn't write that as a joke or as a conceit. I was like, I don't think they have any idea that I'm here. I really don't. But maybe, you know, maybe, you know, check your diaries, 
January 16th, you know, it was like 5.30 Pacific time, so it would have been about 8.30 your time. Maybe you were like, wow, there's something weird this morning. I felt, some, felt something. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm a very rational kind of thinker, so I don't, and I don't tend to go to, you know, but I, I don't know. <laughs> um, and so, I'm, and I'm not sure how, how to revise it, but I am, I'm very interested in, and feel a great deal of, uh, I feel a great deal of gratitude to be able to stand here and, and, and take you all in. And I felt a lot of presence. I, it was really moving to me. You know, someone asked, how do you start a piece of writing? I said, well, you need to look at your preoccupations and begin with the questions that vex you and that you can't get out of your head. And then if that's a circle, then the other circle is, you know, are, are other people's interests and concerns and how do you, and where's the place where those things overlap? Um, and in this case... I mean, I know I'm, I'm really, I'm preoccupied by, by the question of presence. I'm a, I have what psychiatrists call disassociative disorder, which is a, a kind of fancy way of talking about, like, I don't really live in my body. I kind of live somewhere else. And, um, you know, it's often, it's related to... Uh, it can, be re- it can be related to traumatic experience, um, uh, a kind of you know, t- a taking flight f- from the body as a kind of protective thing. Um, and I am highly, highly kind of distracted and abstracted, and I really, my life is hugely governed by fantasy. I mean, I'm really, and I, I don't, thank God, like, you know, there is, I have, I, have a, I have enough of a purchase on reality to, like, behave myself, you know, mostly. But I really, I watch myself all the time having thoughts that, like, they really feel true to me. And then there's this tiny little voice that's like, actually, that is really something you're making up right now. Um, so I'm preoccupied by a question of how do you have presence and how do you have relationship? I mean, at a certain point... You know, I adopted as a course of mental health, like the principle, like once a friend of mine who's a kind of uh, sage, um, I mean, he's a freelance writer for science magazines, but he's, he's, he's a sage to me and my friends. Uh, someone said, what's the secret of life? Or what's the, what's the secret of happiness or the secret of life? And he said, the secret of life is other people. And I just, at a certain point, I adopted that as my core principle for survival, mental health, and my, that's my highest ethical kind of, you know, that's the peak of my, of my kind of ethical system. And I actually, I often make a distinction between ethics and morality. And I actually don't, I don't think about morality much because I think of morality as being something between us and God, or between us and, and, and the great beyond, whereas ethics is, the, is a system uh, that governs our relations with people. And, that, and there's probably, if I studied Jewish history, I, I probably would find there's a lot. Of, J- Jews are really in, in, into relationship as, you know, and Martin Buber, you know, that tradition of I and thou, that the kind of uh, relationship with the other is sort of the highest form. So these, these are qu- preoccupations I've had for a long time, and you know, I do have a long history of mental uh, health issues. And of course, uh, you know, meditation is well known, properly well known as a, as a good place for people who really struggle uh, to, to be mentally healthy you know, as, as a practice. And I just always was like, really confused. Like, what do you mean by now? Like, I really don't get it. And I don't get how it relates to the thing that is the most important thing to me, which is art and art making. So that's all to say that there's a long-standing preoccupation. Then, so how do I keep from being in a totally solipsistic fantasy? Uh, Well, I did really think a lot. I thought a lot about this room, and I thought a lot about what you know, what would be meaningful. I thought a lot about, you know, 
there's certain just very elemental things that make writing work, a lot of physical description. I mean, this is a highly abstract piece, but most people will, if you just say, you know, give some very elemental details about where you are, most people will relax and feel comforted. So that was a way of kind of tending to you, not knowing you, but tending to you. Um, and uh, I don't know, the Back to the Future thing, I was like, well, it's a college, people are younger, I don't know, but that was also a movie that was made 30 years ago. But there was also just a lot of gambling and like stepping onto a cliff and just hoping. And, you know, um, uh, hoping that it, that it would be meaningful. Last night, I was with some friends and I read them this piece and I really felt this acute sense, more acutely than I did with you all. But I was just like, there's a, you know, a plunging off and I have had the feeling before of reading something to someone or telling a story or being on stage and it really doesn't connect and it is the worst it's like running up to hug someone that you love and they turn away from you and then they dematerialize and then they're like evil bozo the clown or something and they start to menace you so you know some of that is really a leap of faith because, you know, um, but I did think about it a lot and, and I continue to th think about it and continue, you know, I think to ask the question about, I guess some artists would say, you know, I don't, you know, it's not for the, you know, the practice for me is not in the audience. I, I do my work and put it out, but I don't see it that way. It doesn't apply to my life that way. I feel like, you know, what I learn from exchange, what I hear from readers, when I do hear from readers, is is very is is really governing for me. Am I speaking to your question? I mean, that's a long, long way of saying I don't know, but I'm really trying. <laughs> that's a beautiful, beautiful question, and I think this is really one of the great um, paradoxes and challenges. And I think you know, art can get quite loosed from ethical uh, concern be and ethical regard, you know, because of that, it, in a, you know, and, you know, there's, there are far too many cases to count of the artist who's so meaningful and, you know, people would fall to their feet, um, but, you know, he's a beastly father or, you know, cruel or, you know, we're now reckoning with, with, uh, you know, with, I think more than ever before, and, and, and you know, with, with actual abuse and, 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 and illegality, you know, abuse that, that, that is quite rightly criminal. And uh, what do you do when that is up against art that you also have found very meaningful? So it's a great question. I think it goes to that tension between a wish to connect and a kind of the pull towards narcissism uh, when you start to sculpt and present, you know. And I, so I don't have an answer for it except for to say I love the question and I, and I think it's a, it's a really important question to keep asking. Um, you know, I do, I do think... Uh, Someone asked earlier when we were, when we were in a, a conversation with, with the students you know, about perfection, and, and we, did, we talked about Leonard Cohen and that you know, beautiful, uh, really, I think, philosophical, uh, you know, Quark's philosophical principle in, in, in Anthem. Um, and I was saying, you know, I think you really have to, perfection is an enemy. Uh, and that you sh and you should show imperfection. I think that's one way of um, I think that's one way of uh, breaking what could be a kind of a perfectly hermetically sealed container that people actually don't get to touch. When you show flaws and imperfections, um, make mistakes. You know, there's an oral storytelling. There's often a great moment. Uh, when someone makes a mistake, 
and they correct themselves. And like, uh, even now, I just, even thinking that, I've just found myself coming back into the room a little bit more, not like drifting off into my mind. Um, people, the audiences love that. It's, it's so real because it's like, and this is what we try to do at the moth is, is, is practice that thing where you're, you're actually not, you're not reciting a text, definitely not on the page, and also it should not be memorized. It's actually being formed in relationship to people. And if you go to, I, how many of you have been to a moth show? If you, if you go, you feel it. Like you really feel that there's, that there's a kind of a cycle of, ex, of, of exchange and that's, that's really lifting everyone up. And that is, you know, in its own very small way, kind of um, is, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of an image for, you know, there's something that disconnects us. There's so much that disconnects us, and, and it's just poking at that and making it a little bit smaller and opening up, you know, tiny little, you know, phone lines between our souls. I have a funny relationship to honesty because I, um, my kind of core, like, psychological, like, uh, and I want to use the word trauma lightly because I don't want to compare myself to a survivor of sexual assault or, you know, a military conflict. I grew up in a, a very bourgeois environment. I never have wanted for food or any material thing. But I was an extremely sensitive child in an extremely unhappy house. And I was the smallest of four people, two brothers and two parents. And the anger and aggression flowed down. And everyone had someone to kick. <laughs> and I was, I was, you know, at the bottom of the kicking tree. And I, even from a very young age, I really wanted to talk about it. And I discovered quite quickly that that was not going to happen. And... Um, so that kind of core thing for me is like, there's a, something true, I feel it, but you crazy people won't talk about it. And that has become my obsession in life, to talk about this stuff. And that's, I think, that's what led me to be a writer, and led me to commit myself to the arts. But I spent a lot of time in my life going way too far with that. And discovering, you know, the hard way that, you know, it is pure honesty is not, you know, it's like, it's like one in ingredient, this is a terrible metaphor, but it's like, you know, if you want to make a good salad dressing, like, yes, you should have some oil, but you also need some vinegar, maybe the other way around, you need some vinegar, but also some oil. Like, honesty is like the vinegar. And like, have you ever had a salad with just vinegar on it? It doesn't, it doesn't taste good. And I discovered that the hard way in my 20s and 30s when I really was like, oh, I'm going to just be honest right now. And I exhausted a lot of people in my life, and I came, I lost a lot of relationships. I lost a lot of time. I almost, you know, and I still to this day, I'm reckoning with some damage in my life from that period. And then, you know, so I guess, I, but, and that to me, I think there's another paradox where, you know, honesty is, is not, you know, honesty becomes meaningful when, there's, when it's honesty and connection. And so then honesty actually also needs to be softened and shaped and sculpted. And I think that's where art comes in, you know, that you actually, you know, that you, Yes, you tell the truth, but you tell it in a way that people can hear it. And therefore, there's an exchange. And then you stop and you listen. And that, I think, enlarges, you know, enlarges the soul and makes safe space. And um, so that, that's my 
yeah, that, those, those are my thoughts. And thanks for that beautiful question. Yeah, um, I think that, uh, you know, I told Leela I wanted to give a talk about fact. And I, I, I pulled back from it in part because the chance to address you live felt like such a special place to do this weird thing that I did. But in part because I have been, I feel very dogmatic about it because I'm so upset by what's happening in this country and by what's happening in particular in the academy around it, around relationship to fact. And um, it's, I'm so, I'm so exorcised about it. It's hard for me to uh, pr produce uh, meaningful, constructive engagement. Um, but one thing that upsets me a lot is this confusion between all the things that we can't possibly know and the things that we can if we're just reasonable about it. And so, and I'm not saying you're doing this at all, but people will very quickly, the moment you start talking about fact and the relevance of fact, and, you know, um, and, and fact is a kind of a primary foundational kind of, uh, like, uh, source of, of, of ethical engagement, they'll very quickly say, well, but what can we know really? And our memories are so elastic and... Uh, the mind isn't even, you know, the, the mind is actually a storytelling device. It's not even, you know, what we perceive is, is, is not even real. It's just, it's something that the mind is making. Like color is not real. Color is a, in a way a kind of story we tell. So people sort of travel down that path. And I'll say, my response to that is, yes. And that's what makes the foundational things that we have in common, that if we're just reasonable, that we can all agree on, all the more important, you know? Um, and, you know, those academics in the room know, probably know John Degada and his, what he's done and what he did in Las Vegas. And this idea that if you're driving up Tropicana and you say you're going west, oh, it doesn't really matter because it sounds better in the sentence. Well, number one, and this is, you see why I didn't give the lecture on this subject, because I'm too emotional. His sentences are not prettier for those errors. They're actually uglier. If you look at the sentences, they are uglier sentences for it. And I think that really matters. Number two, he's dealing with real people and their real feelings, and I think they care. And I think if I were to go home tonight you know, call my girlfriend and say, I got the greatest question from someone with, you know, terrific red hair. You might feel like not seen. And a boy who killed himself, you know, if you call it fiction, then everyone understands that you're loosed from that obligation. But if you don't, I think that that's a violation of, a, of, an, of, of an ethical obligation and these are things we can all agree on, and they're, they're reasonable, fundamental things. And, but here's what's interesting, is I think your question is getting to it. It's not the most interesting thing. The most interesting thing about you is not the color of your hair, which we could all agree is dark. And if we got closer, we could probably all agree you know, we could all stand around in a circle and probably come up with a, a you know, a, a, a more, even more precise word to describe your hair. The most interesting thing is the stuff in your head and in your heart that we could never possibly know. But my belief is if you begin with what can be known or not in the factual realm, that's what opens up a real chance to consider those great mysteries. And I do a lot of work in archives and historical work. I love it when you get to the part where you just don't know. And I, and I make it really clear. And in fact, another subject I'm far too emotional about to <laughs> give a lecture on is the fiction of history. And what historians do when they don't know something, they generally, they just make up something they think is plausible. And I think it's, 
because they don't want to say, well, we don't know. Because then they don't want to say, well, all I've got, I don't have a camera set in 1855 with a big crew and like perfect sound device. All I've got are these letters and there's a gap between 1855 and 1858. And I don't know what happened and I have to really start imagining. They don't want to do that. So they, there's the, they, they create the illusion of an ongoing kind of, uh, they create the illusion of that camera. And, you know, we're not on the record, I don't think. Are we on the record? Yeah. Is this going to be recorded or published or anything? Uh, well, it's being recorded, not being published. Okay. We're going we're to wrap up. <laughs> Start with facts. Facts are, in, in this tradition, an opening into the great unknown. That's my summary. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is incredibly moving.